Good morning all and welcome to a jump advisory recruitment discussion. I hope you're all doing well. This week a new topic starts as we're looking at you know sustainability of your business but we're looking at this week the great resignation. It's certainly you know, loads and loads of headline space across all the press and across all the social media but the question is are we as recruitment agencies and agency owners are we taking note? We need to think that the most expensive part of our business could be but getting weakened, which weakens the infrastructure of our business. The most expensive part of our business are the people. They're the most expensive commodity we've got. But as the agency search for new staff, what are we actually doing to retain our current employees and keeping them happy? Because as we all know, the rec to rep market is out there and they're having probably the hardest time of all the recruitment markets but they're actually into your staff. Staff turnover according to the UK and according to numerous sources, approximately 15%, but according to Pert Box, the global recruiter and several other sources in recruitment, it's around about 43%. However, in the USA, Bullhorn have got that recorded in recruitment at purely around about 25%. According to Top Echelon, one of the big magazines in there, there's three reasons why people are leaving. It's the lack of understanding of how we hire, which to us is really interesting. The inability to attract the right person. Therefore, we're taking inferior people that don't match our culture and the unrealistic expectations to spark, according to spark hire, is we have unrealistic expectations of people in that first six to 18 months in recruitment and therefore we get a huge turnaround in recruitment. They say that recruitment is one of the hardest sales jobs in the world. And this came from all the couple of magazines that I was reading. The hardest sales job in the world due to the rejection rate that recruiters get. And even the hardened salespeople often find that kick is really hard so when we start to look at recruitment i think that rocky saying is really interesting it's not how often you get knocked down but how often you get up that's how winning's done should be really apt for recruitment so the question we've got to think about is our staff if they're getting knocked down how are we helping to get them up what environment are we giving them so we've got to address these factors so today i'm joined by uh, Paul Jacobs, Heather Solway and Paul Sharp. Dave Pye, I believe, is heading to Scotland to chair the annual conference of the charity that he's deeply involved with. So good luck, Dave. We've got an awful lot of questions today and I think they're quite deep reaching. So let's keep our answers short and punchy and let's really kick it off. So the question I've got to <laughs> is start Is that directed with, at anyone in particular, Howard? Is it directed <laughs> at everybody, including myself, because you know, <laughs> Ian and I have been accused of being waffling on He says after a very hours, long intro. Hours, hours, hours. I'll keep going for the next 45 keep, minutes with that Keep hours, going, Howard. Go on. So let's kick off. <clears> the first question is the great resignation. Is it just paper talk or is it actually happening? OK, well, I'll, I'll kick this off. I think it's actually happening. And I think everybody listening knows it's happening. Uh, they can see that with their clients. And I'm afraid to some degree they can see it within their own businesses. Um, I don't personally think uh, that that's a great uh, surprise. We've been through a global pandemic still out there, unfortunately, but we've been through the worst of it, we hope. Um, I think a lot of people who were maybe disgruntled with their employers pre pandemic and have hung in during the pandemic have now made that decision to move to move change jobs we we've seen that churn rate of course within our own uh candidate base but it happens in our own businesses i think also um there is a sense and we'll talk about this i think a bit later howard there's a sense of um increased security people feel uh, more comfortable about looking for a role, a new role now. Uh, what I thought was interesting, just thinking about this in advance, was that, um, and we put out a post last week on this, that it's actually uh, greater in terms of the movement when you look at the various generations, when you take a look at the current generation entering the workplace, i.e. Um, Gen Z. And apparently Gen Z, um, on average, hold jobs for less than two and a half years, two years, three months to be exact. Um, their, their tenure in jobs is the lowest of all the generations, even lower than millennials, who typically stick around for about five years. If you're a, 
a baby boomer like me, you tend to be in jobs <laughs> for about 10,000 years. Um, although, although, Paul, just to cut across what you're saying there, one of the really interesting bits of data about what's happening now is that actually older people are resigning in higher numbers. Um, and and it's you know that's one of the interesting things of I think about the turnover now is that although you're you're absolutely right there really yeah. is a generation Z yeah. um, higher turnover generally but right now you know people are taking the decision to make a late career change so late yeah. on in their career and they're also um, retiring earlier actually well, well, Heather, well. Yeah, I, I do have a theory about that actually and I think it's possibly due to my age that <laughs> it's quite possible that people of my age leave their front doors to go to work and then can't remember where to go um so over <laughs> you know because I do this consistently walk out of rooms and wonder why I was walking into another room so it may be that my generation haven't actually left their jobs they just hadn't I can't remember where to go um, <laughs> that could entirely be the, the situation ah uh, yeah but Paul you're the ones who already should have retired you know? <laughs> for, for, I'm talking about people my age you know who might have died. <laughs> but I, I, I do think it's, it's very interesting that we're at that point where there is this big churn rate. Of course, I, there's no doubt too. It's fueled by the volume of new opportunities out there. Um, 1.1 yes. million jobs available in the UK. And we shouldn't think that's just purely in the logistics chain. That is very apparent across every area. The REC's stats were out, I think, a couple of days ago, the current statistics, um, saying that the only reason that jobs, uh, that, that there's been a softening of, of jobs being filled in the last month is entirely down to the lack of people available to fill those jobs. So there's no there's no dampening down of job opportunities. It's simply not enough people around. We know that. So I think people are, are definitely at this point, and I'll stop talking because I've been told already by Mr. <laughs> H that I can't speak for long, but I think that the great resignation is absolutely happening. And we and as employers need to be extremely aware of what we need to be doing very quickly to prevent our businesses being a factor in that particular situation. So I've, I've got a slightly different view. I think it's very sector and skills specific. Um, I think in certain sectors and skills, we are seeing uh, a lot of churn and a lot of turnover, uh, but not in every sector. And particularly the ones where they are maybe in the areas, maybe some professional skills and roles whereby salaries are increasing quite rapidly um, and skills are very much in short supply. Then those are the areas that I'm seeing from my perspective, where they're having a, a slightly higher turnover rate than some of the others. Coming back to Howard's uh, quote about staff retention and specifically about recruitment agencies, you know, Deloitte always said anything less than 30% staff turnover was upper quartile performance. Anything above 30% was not good. I can remember um, taking over the HR department at Interquest where the staff turnover was nearly 50% and getting that down over a three year period to 36. It never went below 36%. I can remember working at ADECO at one point in my career. And, and Paul, you, you might be able to um, reinforce this. But the staff turnover rate from memory was around sort of sixty five percent. No, it was higher than that, mate. I think at a point when I was there was we shouldn't denigrate our previous employer, but I would say <laughs> it was closer to about a hundred percent. I think you'll find I remember that yeah. very well because I was on the board at the time. Yeah. So it's 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 a real challenge in recruitment, and you know the, I know we're going to come on to things like the cost of recruitment and stuff, but you know that is really important. Um, I was talking to two, three rec to rec uh, companies last week, and Howard just mentioned the same point. And they are finding it incredibly difficult to make uh, to make placements uh, because people in recruitment agencies are now digging in and they tend to be digging in because they tend to be making money. Um, yeah. so even the average recruiter is now doing fairly well. Uh, and that's a key driver in, in driving churn, the churn rates down. So I think in industry as a whole, very sector specific in recruitment, I think we're going to see more change next year i think for this year i think we i don't think it'll increase much more than what we've seen yeah i i think you're right paul um i do i think that right now it's easier it's not easy right but it's easier in a market like this for an average recruiter to be above average and therefore not get performance managed out by their manager because they can make enough money to be showing a profit on their cost and so so yeah i i think you're right i think there are people you can see the opportunity to make money where they are 
and are then less likely to look over ah, their shoulder. Well, I'm afraid I'm afraid I'm going to have to stand in You're the You're going to disagree. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I actually think we should be really very, very alert to the possibility of very good people being wooed by competitors uh, because I'm seeing it elsewhere. And um, I don't think I think we'll talk about this in a moment. Uh, money is important. And there's no doubt that you're, what you've said is true. The good guys are making a lot of money at the moment. That's true. But I think it's, as we'll talk about, it's much deeper than the actual salary. Um, that, that the reasons why people are looking to leave or can or, or are inclined to leave. Um, and I think there's some quite serious issues that employers need to be very aware of right now. So I personally, I'm not sure that we've seen the bottom of it. I think it's still a danger for, for recruitment businesses. So what we're saying is that the great resignation is happening irrespective yes, of definitely. whether it's press, it's definitely happening. And therefore, all people on this call or people who listen to this call afterwards and, and pick up the video of it, et cetera, et cetera, you know, need to take haste of what they're doing with their current staff and how they are trying to engage with them more and more. You know, during COVID, a lot of recruitment agencies obviously shed a lot of staff. And we saw that, you know, as their words, we're trying to get better staff in for our business. Um, but before we answer what we keep people, what do you think consultants or why do you think consultants actually resign? I mean, what we've also got to think about is this time of year is the traditional resignation period, isn't it? As we're coming up to Christmas, new, new, year, new year job in the new year, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of people will be starting to get ready to resign either just before Christmas or in, in January. So what do you think or why do you think consultants resign? Well, I, I, you know, I think it comes down to a lot of things in our industry sector. It's a, you said earlier, and you're right, Howard, it's, a, it's not an easy um, industry. I mean, we've been in it many years, the people listening, I believe, uh, all of those guys listening, I can see their names have been around in the industry for a long time now. We're in the minority, lots of people come and go, as we know, in our industry sector. It's a tough industry sector, it's hard sales, we don't like to use that phrase, but it is, it's full of rejection, and you have to be a Bit of a tough cookie to get to get through it mentally strong uh, physically strong too and i think the, the the issue here is that there's so much going on every every agency right now is so busy that with so many jobs to fill overwhelmed by opportunity the pressure's on and i think um uh, employers need to be aware of the pressure that people are under at this point in time um their mental well-being, the hours they're putting in to the company. And I think we need to be very careful that we show our people how valued they are and, and be very supportive towards them. If we really apply huge amounts of pressure because we see the opportunity to obviously um, make a lot of placements or get a lot of contractors out, um, and we're not careful, then people will burn out or they'll just feel that they're they're undervalued. And I think that will drive people away from businesses very quickly. Um, it isn't about how much money they can make with you. They can make money elsewhere with others. It's about how valued they feel, how connected they feel to the business. Um, and I think that's the big issue. There's a big opportunity, as we know, in the recruitment industry to do extremely well. Our clients are all doing very well, thank goodness. But that pressure comes with it, and we just need to be very mindful to create the right balance. But th those there. those things have been around for an awful long time, Paul, and I, I generally believe those things have been around a long time and why people resign. I think what's changed, though, through COVID is that people have become a little bit more aware of their position within yeah. the business, and that lack of autonomy is really something that people are understanding that they have no autonomy in their business they have no control of their work-life balance they have no control of certain things where now you can get that elsewhere you know we talk an awful lot and we've started to implement with lots of clients mentoring and leadership programs to actually mentor and help people get beyond their current place and get to the next stage of their career plan so i think there's a lot of people in recruitment that have that perceived glass ceiling effect above them and therefore they can now see opportunities elsewhere in forward thinking companies i mean how many posts have i seen on linkedin just recently of recruitment agencies moving to a four-day week and things like that just trying to give their staff a little bit more um opportunity but what they said was they'd taken that decision based on what their employees had fed back to them so they were giving autonomy back to the employees to talk about them and i think a lot of it is at the moment is what you talked about there paul is that lack of direction i think a lot of recruitment agencies still treat their recruiters like battery hens 
hence why it's 43% attrition rate. If we start to carry on treating people like battery hens, burnout happens, you know, and that happens very quickly. And people move from industries because they don't enjoy what they're doing, where I think actually there's a lot of things to enjoy in recruitment if you actually put the right things into place. So I think to me, the big thing is that glass sieving, lack of mentorship, lack of, lack of true career plan, and that ultimate lack of autonomy where they feel part of a tribe and they have a, a, a say in what actually goes on in their career and their work-life balance. I think for, for me, this is a topic of great, great debate in uh, in our household. Um, and I, I was talking to Dr. Ruth Sharp, as she reminds me her title is. Uh, <laughs> um, Brilliant. And, and, and she, she, she brought me back to these two factors, which I, I tend to agree with. And, and Heather, you'll probably um, uh, be familiar with Hertzberg, but you, you talk about um, motivational factors and hygiene factors. And I think we, you know, if you delve into the detail of these and you look at what drives job dissatisfaction, it's working conditions. And Howard, you've mentioned some of those there about ability to work from home or a four day week. It's your policies, your procedures and your rules. It's your pay and your reward and your incentivization. It's your relationship with your other core workers. And it's how you are supervised, managed and led. Those are the five key areas that drives job dissatisfaction. So one of the things I always ask you know, my clients is, so if that drives job dissatisfaction, how close are we to our people? How much have we built that psychological relationship where people feel safe and comfortable in articulating what their needs and wants are from work? And how often do we ask for feedback? And that for me is a really key driver. And then to ask for feedback, you're getting to then the whole host of things about training and development, which I'm sure Heather will expand on. <laughs> and Paul, between me and Dr. Ruth Sharp, your, your missus, will turn you into an HR professional. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great description of Hertzberg. <laughs> it's a great description of Hertzberg. And I, I do, I think we have, you know, we're talking about the negative side of it here slightly, Howard. I think that was deliberately how the question yeah. was posed, right, about why why people leave. There's just the opportunity for some massive own goals, aren't there, at the moment, because there are some things that organisations have just got to be doing, because if they don't get them right, they are, they're going to create that dissatisfaction, which is that negative half of the Hertzberg stuff. So things like not allowing flexible working, like not allowing remote working, like not giving autonomy, like like not investing in your leaders so that they understand about leadership and motivation. They're just massive own goals. So yeah, totally support what you're saying, Paul. So then let's, let's put a little challenge out to ourselves then. Okay. So the challenge is just giving three reasons why recruiters should stay with their current employer without giving song and verse so just give genuine the three reasons why you think recruiters will stay with their current employers okay so, so that's a nice little nudge ah, to on. keep your answer short no nudge at all <laughs> full on punch in the face oh, I, 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 I mean I, I, can I, i'll take that up from dr pepper and uh, see where we go with that um i i, I would say um I mean, unquestionably, Annette uh, put a great note up on, on the chat box, and she's absolutely right. It is about culture. It is about a feeling of belonging, being part of a family unit, um, people feeling that they're valued in that sense, that their voices are heard, they're listened to, uh, there's inclusion. I think th th those are very, that's a very important point. I do think that your point about flexibility is very important now. Nobody, I think it's very clear people do not want to work. Most people, let's say, don't want to work five days a week any longer in the office. Um, there's no reason why we should should be doing that any longer. That's all gone now. So having that flexibility, I think, is extremely important. And lastly, I think feeling part of a journey, um, understanding where the business is going, and I guess that horrible um, an ac uh, acronym, what's in it for me, where am I going, where can I be in the next two, three years, how does that align with where the business is traveling, and I think those are, are very strong reasons why people stick around in businesses, and money isn't one of my comments, as you'll have noticed. Mr. Sharp? Well, I think for me, um... I'm going to go to the opposite side of the uh, Herzberg model now, which is the motivational factors. And I touched upon this on the video that I pushed out on LinkedIn last week. Um, and you've mentioned one of them, but the, these are autonomy, achievement, recognition, 
responsibility, progression, and personal growth. Hang on, that's about eight there. We've only got three. We're only asked for three. We're asked for three. three plus three. So yeah. th those, are the, those are the three plus three, which is six. Those are the six key <laughs> drivers of how to drive job satisfaction. The key bit there is the culture and the managers, because how you achieve that will be largely down to the culture in your, in your business and your manager's ability to make those things happen. And I'll, I'll hold fire from the manager bit, because I know, I know you're going to come on to it later on, but that for me is the key bit, Howard. It, it's the manager, the culture, but you've got to drive those six key components. And uh -huh. because, because you've done six, I'll just do one, just for balance. <laughs> So, so I, I think that in recruitment, we're really good at measuring numbers, um, measuring value, um, you know, cash value, return on investment in individuals. We're really good at valuing people for the volume of business that they came in. And if you could do one thing differently, it would be to make sure that every single person in your business understands that they're valued for themselves. Hmm. And so their career and their ambition and their personal goals are valued and invested in. Um, not just all of the incredibly important um, Heather, monetary Heather, things too. Heather, how often do we think we know what our people think because we've <laughs> got a really close relationship with them? We know, we know what they like, but actually we don't ask them in a secure, safe environment. Exactly, they yeah. And actually give us that feedback ob objectively. Yeah. I think that's yeah. part of one of my three things was you know the first one we've, we've touched quite a bit on which is work-life balance and that flexible arrangement I think people have changed dramatically from when I walked into recruitment when it was seven o'clock in the morning till seven o'clock in the morning you know and <laughs> you know you didn't have a break in those times I used to get up three hours before I went to bed to go to work you know, it was, it was <laughs> like that's, that, that type of scenario so I think that flexible working arrangement is really bad. but I think the bigger thing is what Paul starts to sort of allude to is that being feeling that you're part of something bigger and you understand what your part of that journey is and what you play and what your journey is in that journey. And I think that is the bigger thing that make people stay. If they feel they're part of something bigger, they've got a part to play in that. And so things like setting up mentoring schemes to help people along those journeys are really important. And I think the other side of this, and I think the side that none of us have touched on yet, is that reducing employees' pain. I'm not talking the physical pain that some agencies that, that you know, put on a, a, a consultants, but the mental pain of the part of their roles. You know, do their systems work? Do their systems cause stress? Do the pressure that you're putting on by having unrealistic KPIs cause stress, et cetera, et cetera? If you change that and have a, a less pressured environment, then people will be more productive and stay longer. And I think that's the sort of things that we get to in those sort of three things. So if we then put all of our, you know, I was going to say, if we put our, you know, three, six, nine, 12, 18, 16, 14, fit 12 uh, for Paul Sharp in there as well, how do agencies <laughs> change their employers ex employees' experience in order to reduce that recruitment attrition rate of 43%? But how do we how do we do that? Because we've got to make a big step to do that now. I have one word, cake. I am cake. Cake works <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. You bring cake around in the office, everybody smiles. <laughs> but it's easy. Just buy lots of cake. I, I, I think if we, only it was I, that I, easy. it works for me, kid. Cake and prosecco <laughs> I'll work for anybody. Um I, I do actually think that we need to look at um uh, what it is that people truly want in this day and age. I mean, clearly, uh, we, we talk about old fashioned um, perks and so forth, um, and they are important, you know, good pension plans, medical plans, and so forth. I think those are all staples. And I think we ought to be considering if we haven't got them, getting them in play. Um, but I, I do also think that uh, we need to look at sort of modern methods of retaining people. What are the modern people, as it were, want? Uh, these days, I talked the other week to a client about this very point and said, wouldn't it be great if we had somebody in the business that provided concierge services, i.e., you know, you need a plumber, this person would find that person for you, you need to uh, do some research on schools, or you need to find a removal van or whatever, wouldn't it be brilliant, this is a fairly sizable company, that we have somebody that would do that for you, a sort of assistant, a support person. 
And interestingly, looking at some articles prior to this webinar, I came across one that made that very same suggestion. Uh, this person that wrote the thing said, I would work for any company that would provide me with someone that would do that sort of thing for me. And I'm, I know this is a sort of odd example, but it does mean that we need to be quite flexible and creative with our thinking when we're considering what it takes to keep people in our businesses and what it is that people generally want these days to reduce uh, recruitment, uh, 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 sorry, uh, to, to reduce attrition. One of the things that I think Paul made the point about, and it's a great point, is that we need to be closer to our people. And that isn't just about having a cup of tea with them. I think it really is making sure that the processes in the business regularly give us the opportunity to get in, to be informed. That obviously comes down to one-to-ones, uh, performance reviews, opportunities to sit down with people, but also, of course, asking people via um, surveys and other methods what it is that they're feeling about the company and what they're looking for and we can't pretend we know because things change very quickly so I'd, add, I'd definitely support Paul's point on that. Can I just say something slightly controversial to uh, from a HR professional to what you're saying Paul? I know so, I can see your face I'm thinking <laughs> she doesn't agree with this she's about to say something. I, I don't disagree I think there is a there is a difference in emphasis mm. so I think what you're talking about with pensions and concierge service love it love concierge service pensions healthcare, all of those things I think they're, they're great they're fantastic and if you provide them as a caring paternalistic employer fantastic but they will make no difference at all if you don't get the other stuff right I agree so you've no, got agree. to have but yeah. you know if you're looking at a list of things and you go yeah. oh well actually put in private medical insurance that's a quick thing I can just chuck some money oh, at you it are right, and put course. that in yeah. it's just not you've yeah. got to do the other stuff first you've got to have good management good leadership correct good vision good culture good values and then all of that other stuff is an extra thing that ties people in yeah. all right yeah. on its own it won't work yeah no, it's cosmetic. all I would add it's, it's, yeah, it's exactly. cosmetic otherwise I totally agree yeah. with you and we can all and we without naming names we can all point fingers in perhaps towards ex-employees so providing let's, lots of those sort of benefits. Let's yeah, push exactly. that on. Let's push that on a bit. Paul, you, you look like you you want to sort of jump in and have something to say there, Mr. Sharp. No, I'm just going to add, you know, having done this over the past eight years and Heather's been doing it as well, um, you know, I think what, what's been said is absolutely right. Um, I think, you know, the pool table, um, you know, the drinks cabinet, you know, they're just they're just periphery benefits. Yeah. The bit that has made the biggest difference to employee satisfaction, and, and I always measured, it, measured this through um, you know, things like pulse surveys and, and taking out an NPS score, was the management and leadership training. That by far creates more stickiness with your people yeah. and helps you build that psychological contract. It's the mm. psychological contract you have to really build and leverage. If you do that, it makes it really hard for people to leave the business. So when you talk about how do you drive retention, that training for supervisors, managers, leaders, that was by far, had the by far the biggest impact beyond belief. Yeah. So I'm going to go a slightly different way on this, because I think there's, there's lots of things that we're talking about that they're all part of it. When I sort of uh, became part of the ADECO group at Computer People, I took on one of the worst performing officers in the, in the UK. And within 18 months, had it to be the highest performing office in the UK and then took on a region that was being absolutely dwarfed by the London region and had that northern region then dwarfed the London region. And the reason we changed was all about two things. And it was all about the corporate communication from the top. So that was from myself and, and, and my boss at the time at the top down was to our team, to our management and to our team, but ensure that that corporate communication was actually understood. So I made a point of every time that we put a communication out, whether it be verbal, whether it be written, et cetera, to ring the newest employee in each individual office to see whether they actually understood what that communication actually meant for them. And if they didn't understand it, then I would go and re-communicate that again or go back to my managers and get them to re-communicate again. The second side is what Paul was talking about a little bit is about that individual basis, having that communication, that individual relationship with each people. So I was very at heart of getting it to understand the hearts and minds of my individual people and I think the best compliment I ever get was uh, got was from one of my uh, my managers said yo what's really good about you is you're great at motivating me but you're great at stopping me as well 
because you bring me down to earth constantly. You know exactly where I'm going and exactly what I'm doing. And it's having that understanding of your individuals on that level that you can do that. So that emphasis on teamwork and that emphasis on belonging was a really important part of keeping my attrition rate down. And like you, Paul, I dropped my attrition rate to below 25% within my region. And it was about training development. But the big side was all about recognition. And it wasn't recognition from a money point of view, because I, I am a, a firm believer that money isn't a motivator for 99% of the people. Yes, there's that 1% that's really money motivated. It's actually finding out what they truly were recognised by. Um, I started to put things, simple things in where, you know, Paul Sharp might have enjoyed me shouting across the office, Paul, that's an amazing effort, very well done, where Heather would actually cringe at that. So dropping Heather a little email saying, <laughs> Heather, that was an awesome week, well done, would get far more benefit from the staff but it was actually knowing that when I was running multiple offices I'd ring my office managers before I went into each office and say give me a really good highlight of each individual person and when I walked in I could go Paul Jacobs I hear you open this account today or you did this or you did that and people didn't know because I had sort of you know, a couple of hundred people to manage, but all of a sudden having that individual relationship was really important. And I think that yeah. communication on a corporate and an individual basis and making sure people understand it is really important. So we've had her. So you know, just oh, so you on. know, Howard, if you want to shout across the, the office how great I am, that's fine with me. I don't need a quiet email. It's not going to yeah. happen, though, is it, Heather? <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> virtual <laughs> office. Happen, is it? Every morning, Heather, I shout across my own office. If you can't hear it from Leeds to Birmingham, then that's your problem. <laughs> that's <laughs> my problem. <laughs> my, my, my communication has not got through. We've had Herxburg <laughs> thrown at us, and we've generally had Herxburg thrown at us. Let's sort of throw another sort of uh, <laughs> business person. Let's bring Maslow's hierarchy of oh. needs into it. Can I just say this is not my fault, okay? This is not HR doing it. Howard's done this all by himself. But, I, but I think this is a really interesting one. So Maslow turned around and said, you've got biological and physical needs. You've got safety needs. You've got social needs. You've got esteem needs. And you've got self-actualization needs. Mm -hmm. So if employees are moving away from the traditional motivators, such as money, which is not one of Maslow's needs, what would you build your retention strategy around okay so i think if we look at if we look at oh, the Paul, base, that was quick that was me all ready to go yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> hold on Paul, Paul, stop there <laughs> heather let's get in there let's get hold, in there heather. hold on hold on <laughs> I, 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 if we're looking at modern maslow's needs can we also at the base of the pyramid include netflix wi-fi uber yeah. eats and amazon <laughs> please because i think those things are staples now for people they um, are i love that meme where they've put those on it's the back and it's, it it's true unfortunately for yeah. all of us um, good wi-fi connection <laughs> i think that um if you are if we are looking at uh, a one you're asking for one thing i would say for me it would always be based around a sense of security and i, I think that's kind of one word that describes quite a broad subject because I think if you feel settled and you feel, as we said earlier, valued, and you can see the direction of, of, of the journey for the business, you're feeling um, supported. Um, and there is a sense of, as I say, security. There's a very strong chance that you'll, you'll hang around, I think, in, in many instances. People do, you know, they're, if they're feeling fear, they'll also, they'll also follow, following on from that with flight. So I think making sure that your people are, are felt uh, feel valued and taken care of and all the things we've discussed for me is the biggest driver when you're looking at how you retain people if you're looking at Maslow's hierarchical needs so on that what Maslow said then on that was safety needs are all about the protection from the elements and the elements from the outside and inside your business security how you feel secure you have to have order and you have to have law and you have to know your limits and that creates stability and feed freedom from fear. And that's what Maslow wrote about the safety you, needs. You've got to let Solway talk because she's desperate. I'm going to let Solway talk. <laughs> I'm just I thought, laughing at listening to you talking about Maslow. It's brilliant. I, I love it. I just thought for the for the for the, for the audience, they might not understand what Maslow wrote <laughs> yeah. about the safety of needs. So I thought it'd be interesting. That yeah, no, 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 I agree. It is. Yeah, so Heather, get stuck in, Heather. <laughs> I think you have to treat Maslow's hierarchy as a totality. I don't think it's about individuals. It, it, it's about the way in which they interact. So Maslow's talking about the fact that we have at the bottom one set of needs and then we have the next set and we can't move up until the, the one below is met. 
So you cannot talk to people about self-actualization, for example, when you're in the middle of a redundancy program, even if the redundancy program doesn't affect that people because a redundancy program goes to the root of somebody's biological and physical needs because you're potentially taking away their income, which impacts their housing and their environment and their safety needs. So it's understanding how each of them builds on each other. And so your retention strategy has to be built around all of them and all of them in the right order. And it has to understand that you need to be thinking about all of them in order when you're building a retention strategy. And money's a really interesting one because actually money can potentially feed into all of them. Mm. Right? So that's why money works so well in some industries if it's done well, because having it helps you meet your biological and your physical needs and your safety needs, but it also helps you meet your social needs because you can afford to go out to the pub and it helps you invest in a training program to, uh, to help you self-actualize. So actually money is fascinating because it runs across all of them. But I think, I don't think there's one of them that you have to focus on. I think you have to focus on all of them and you have to understand how they interact with each other. There you go, Greenwood. Stick that up your pipe. You didn't understand any of that, did you? It's in my pipe. I'm smoking it and I'm loving it. Mr. Sharp. Uh, Heather's captured it beautifully and I'm just glad I'm going after Heather and not before Heather. Um, I think, I think the, only, the only thing I'm just going to add is, you know, I, I, I'm not too hung up on Maslow because it's a general theory of motivation. Um, yeah. It's the reason why, you know, Hertzberg is around specific job satisfaction, dissatisfaction. So it, it's a general life theory of motivation is, is the only caveat I'd, I'd add to that. Which I think may be true, Paul, because it it's, you know, like if you look at all theories, they're all holistic and they're all sort of encompassing and some are based on work, some are based on work-life balance, et cetera. Is, is Heather getting a book out? She, 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 out. She, she, no, no, I was getting uh, a packet of tissues. No, I think she's getting a book out to throw at you, Paul, I think. Uh, but I have got a book, if you want me to go. <laughs> if you start to think about the, the social needs that he brings in, and I think this is the bit where we start to think about is that sense of belonging, that affection and yeah. love. You know, from a work group, from a family, from a friend, power. and that romantic relationship. We have a romantic relationship with recruitment, but actually what we get is we get that beaten out of us by KPIs. We love putting people into jobs, but that's only a very small percentage of what we do. So we actually beat that out. Where we look at those esteem needs, those achievements, the mastery, independence, status, you know, dominance, self-respect and respect for others are all things that if you start to think about building a team, that is what you need to start to build in. So all those sort of things that Maslow brings in are about creating culture and about building culture. So I understand your comment, Paul, about, you know, Hertzberg and about Maslow's being a bit more generic, but when you start to build a team, this is absolutely the things that you think about putting into a team because he starts to think about all of those things about the biological that shelter warmth and how you feel when you're in a business if you feel warmth and you feel the shelter then you're going to be more likely to stay within that business rather if you feel an outsider in that business you don't trust people in that business you're not liked in that business you don't like the people you work with you're more than likely going to move along so here's a question then what's the cost to the business when an employee leaves very it's quickly it's on, enormous. It, well it's enormous um, let me start quickly and I'll, I'll shut up basically it's an enormous cost i mean we can't just look at it from the perspective of an empty desk not making at least ten thousand pound a month which is the general sort of level these days One hundred twenty thousand is pretty much what most people would ask a consultant to make in most areas of recruitment it's a much larger cost than that in terms of the investment in having to replace that person the time it takes and also the morale uh, the, the lack of morale, the damage to morale in a business. I could go on and on, but it's an enormous cost. Uh, but as Heather is the HR expert, I will now, <laughs> I will now kowtow and allow, allow Heather to complete my paragraph. No, I'm throwing my toys out of the pram and I'm not answering this question. <laughs> no. Uh, no, clearly, I mean, you put it in a Maslow context, right? Somebody leaves an organisation and makes everybody else reevaluate their decision exactly. to stay you know so you know take what you say is utterly valid paul an empty desk is a cost to the business it's a Just huge a lost bit. opportunity but but there are implications for other people around the business and that actually that's the same whether or not you choose to have that person leave and you're in control of it or they resign so the impact of other people leaving has a motivational uh, impact on the people around them 
so, and, yeah, your, and your clients, of course. I mean, if you can't um, if you can't serve your clients to the degree you would like to, they have a habit of disappearing and going somewhere else. So, you know, there's an enormous um, an enormous cost to the business. It's exactly why everybody knows that there is there's so many counter offers going on when they place people in jobs. It's the thing we talk about all the time when we're working within our clients that we need to be extremely mindful of making certain that our candidates are aware of the great potential they're going to be counter offered because employers know that losing people is going to cost them a small fortune in terms of finding a replacement and so forth and tomorrow and next week we're going to talk very much about the counter offers but what you're talking about there paul is if your countering offer is and, and people leaving it's that lack of self-respect that the business has for that person so yeah. going back to that uh, esteem needs that maslow brings out with but also the lack of warmth that that company has for that person why haven't they addressed that before that so again the biological and physical needs are not, are not being met by that person you know paul I was just going to say, the, um, I, I'm fairly sure, Heather, the CRPD reported the actual cost of staff turnover. Was it one and a half or two and a half times a salary? Two and a half times salary. Two and a half times yeah. a salary. So that's what the CRPD reported was the actual cost to the business. Um, I think outside of that, and we've just touched upon it, so I won't repeat it, it's the psychological damage it does amongst the peers and the rest of the team because everybody does start to reevaluate. Um, what everybody else is doing and not only that but when I mentor um, internal recruiters um, I always tell them the first thing they should always do when they hire somebody is ask who they are connected with and who they referred who they would refer and who they worked with absolutely so it's not only um, when you lose somebody it's the fact that somebody else is all over that individual to try and milk them for as much information Domino effect. and data as what you possibly can what I will say and we just mentioned about pay um, this bit about pay trans having transparency over pay and a really clear career structure and people understanding how they get from A to B and what do they do to have to achieve it and you having a framework is one way that you can head these pay conversations off because if somebody says to you I want an extra 10 grand my, my answer is always of course you can have an extra 10 grand but now you've got to bill an extra 100 grand to you know to, for me to be able to afford the extra 10. I've never mind signing off, signing off anybody's pay, pay and wage increase, providing there was a, a contract and, and an agreement whereby people were very clear what the expectation was if they commanded a higher salary. So by putting that transparency in there and having a framework which is very open and people understand what they've got to do to 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 you know be rewarded with a higher pay equivalent to the earnings, I think is really important. And if people haven't done that, now is a really good time to do it. I think so you're like, hot. You're hard. Hundred thousand. Hundred thousand. Yeah, I was going to say that's a bit. I'd thirty grand. I mean, I'd, I'd, <laughs> did anybody ever work for you, Paul Sharp? I don't know. <laughs> well, there you go. So let's move the question along then. So let's let's look at the last question because obviously, you know, we've got a lot of people on today that are listening, and I think this, out of all the topics we've talked about, is the way we should end. This is really important. If we said, what's the most important thing a leader should do immediately after this webinar to set a retention strategy in motion, what would that be? Go talk to your people, go and listen to them, find out what they're thinking, get close to them for a variety of different methods. Um, get, and make, don't assume anything just because they're being paid well or the business is booming, or that your biggest biller is, is, is making a huge amount of bonus, don't assume a thing. Go and speak to them individually, collectively, and through a variety of other anonymous methods. Find out what's in their minds and start to address those gaps. I would benchmark and gather data around what, create an environment where people can absolutely safely say what they feel by using either we, we have a pulse a jump pull survey or there's various apps out there you can use so benchmark how people are currently feeling and then work on a really strong development plan for your managers and leaders and heather and i have spent an awful lot of time recently delivering a program of specific training aimed at helping people get you know become better managers and better leaders so having some structure around that and delivering it is really important heather 
uh, I'm going to do in a we've got one minute left a shameless plug so go and read the article that I wrote this week on LinkedIn about retention there are five key things in that article that I think that you should go and do now and the top one is going to focus on your managers uh, and whether they are being given the skills to manage their teams properly 100% so I'm going to I'm going to pull it into a practical <clears throat> session then so I think a lot of leaders think they've probably done everything that we've talked about today and it's probably all in their head and it's not actually in a, in a business plan. So what I would say is go grab a senior member of your staff and a junior member of your staff and ask them to lay out what they think the company's retention strategy is because then you'll discover how much they do not know and how much that you need to then implement. Once you've got an understanding of that, then what Paul's talking about, the net promoter score or doing a staff survey is absolutely right. And once you've established that, you've got to then put in to what the people are saying to help with that attrition. And what Paul said is we've all doing management training with, with our clients, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's build a strategy and roll it out. And I would say you've got between now and the end of December to really get that strategy pulled together and then roll it out. You need to be able to demonstrate that you can deliver. Otherwise, it's just another reason why people leave. It's just another empty promise. So grab two people, grab a senior member, a junior member of your staff, and ask them why they would stay, what you think the retention policy of the business is, and then start to build behind that because you'll start to find out how weak that it is in their mind so ladies and gents thank you very much it's been a pleasure as always it's always good to have plenty of luminaries thrown into the conversation and test our technical and educational skill set we look forward to seeing you next week where we are going to be talking about next week um the counter offer and what's happening with the counter offer and how we can potentially avoid that counter offer so please join us next week if you know anybody else that's interested get them to sign up too thank you very much guys it's been much a pleasure see you next week see you everybody yeah. take care bye, bye. bye everybody <laughs>